first thing everyone sees of you. Hi, my name is Suzanne Switzenberg, and I'm the Adult Services Librarian at Lewis and Clark Library in Helena, Montana. I'm delighted to be joined by Rachel Hartman for a conversation about the adventures of Tom Sawyer by Mark Twain. This is part of the Big Read, a program of the National Endowment for the Arts in partnership with Arts Midwest. Rachel Hartman's first YA or young adult fantasy novel, Serafina, was published by Random House in 2012. The sequel, Shadow Scale, will be coming out in March of 2015. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm really excited about this. I think this will be fun. Oh, I'm excited too. This, yes, definitely. In this looking classic forward to novel, Tom Sawyer. <laughs> in this classic novel, Tom Sawyer is a bad. He gets his friends to do his work. He lies. He often acts impulsively and without regard for others, mainly Aunt Polly and the other grown-ups around him. Tom pushes against blind obedience to the adult hypocrisy and strictures of his society. Yet, when the moment of truth comes, he does the right thing and testifies on behalf of Muff Potter, saving the man's life. So, Rachel, in your experience as an author, what do you think of Tom Sawyer? I think he's wonderful good fun. I had such a good time reading this. I read it first when I was probably 11 years old, uh, and I had forgotten parts of it, but there were parts that I really did remember, uh, various adventures that he had, and... Um, I enjoy reading classics, actually, that's always sort of been my thing. Uh, and so it, reading this was, was it reminded me what I like about it in a way that, that there's sort of an episodic nature to it, you know, that he does this. That it's, it's almost like a little picaresque novel of his little adventures. And as he goes on, you know, it's really, it's really, um, he grows and you see him, him grow and it just felt like it was really, really good fun. And if I could write a character, I think that, that, Nice. Had that much personality, and was that well remembered? You know, I think that's everybody's dream. <laughs> so we'll see. <laughs> so is it different looking at Tom Sawyer as a mom? Would you let your kids hang out with Tom? <laughs> that's a good question. <laughs> um, in fact, my child may be Tom. So no, just kidding. Um, I feel like. <laughs> <laughs> it does. It does give me a different perspective on it than I would have had as a kid. I think as a kid, I felt more like he was this adventurer and and somebody you sort of wished you could do that. Uh, as a mom, part of me is like, okay, anybody who talks about you know kids today and their their internet and their video games and their TV and how they're bouncing off the walls all the time really should sit down and read this and realize that children were bouncing off the walls for hundreds of years before the uh, video games uh, came to prevalence. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, it almost, it's actually kind of encouraging. This is going to sound counterintuitive, but it's a bit encouraging to me to say, okay, wow, you know, <laughs> some kids are just this way uh, and finding the walls extra bouncy. Um, would I let my child hang out with him? <laughs> I would want him to come over here and maybe hope that maybe... A bit. <laughs> um, but I think he's a good-hearted kid. I, I really, you know, Aunt Polly keeps saying that, and I, I, I believe her. You know, she's she's sort of a soft-hearted mm -hmm. individual herself, and I, I, but I feel like she, she sees the good in him, and and she is part of what helps us see the good in him as well. I was just going to ask that. Um, do you think when Twain created a Tom being orphaned and Aunt Polly taking care of him, that he sets up the the way that we see Tom, like you said, as being a good kid at heart, because all of his actions are, he's not, you know, he's mischievous, he's not, you know, evil or, yes. or malicious, um, but he's definitely, he doesn't act like a good guy for most of the book. <laughs> that's true, that's true. I think, though, that what he's doing is actually really typical of kids, um, in my experience, uh, which is that that he he's thinking about himself first. He's he's thinking about his fun first, his own mm -hmm. pleasure, and not what effects it's going to have on anybody else. And that's something that I think we all outgrow eventually. I hope we ought to outgrow that and be able to think about other people's feelings. But there's actually one key moment in the book that I thought was really interesting where I felt like he did get the littlest inkling. Um, it's the moment where um, 
Aunt Polly, he, he has gone to the island, he's come back, and he told her he had this dream, and then she finds out that that was a lie. And she is so mad at him. And it's like it's, a little light bulb goes on in his head. He suddenly realizes, oh, I really did hurt her feelings. And he tells her the truth that he, he, he was going to tell her, he was going to wake her and leave this, or leave this message, but then he thought it would be more fun to show up at his own funeral. And learning this, she, it touches her heart, and she's like, well, she's able to kind of forgive him, but she does check his pocket, and she finds this message and realizes he was telling the truth. And that just warms her heart mm -hmm. and just makes her able to forgive him. But he then, the very next thing he does, is he goes and apologizes for being a jerk to Becky. And I thought to myself, aha, yes, he, he's had this little bit of insight that he didn't have before that his actions affect other people's feelings. Um, now, of course, then Becky is still mad at him and it, that doesn't really go anywhere. <laughs> but but um, there are little like moments of progress like that in the book. Uh, and I feel like those are really important and, and help us have sympathy for him. So Nice. Do you um, do you forgive Tom for his trespasses, so to speak? No, I they're think not I really do. I, well, things, I mean, but. yeah, no, he he's pretty naughty, <laughs> as my mother used to say, naughty. Um, but uh, <laughs> I think I do because there there is you know he's he's not actually usually hurting people, right? He's not. I mean, he does do some some bad boy things. He smokes, and they run away, and they skip school, and but he's not. He's more just just trying to have a good time than out to maliciously hurt anyone. And I think I think that goes a long way uh, toward any hero or heroine making them sympathetic. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I forgive him. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna uh, kind of go in a different direction here. Um, I was reading on your blog, and you talked about a story called "The Death of Adulthood in American Culture." Oh yeah, that article. Which yes. I thought was, yeah, that was very interesting. Um, mm -hmm. And in it, the author is A.O. Scott, and he's talking about TV shows, which I just think of as another platform for storytelling. Um, mm -hmm. And he said that they rely on the meticulous revisionist, present-minded depiction of the past. And mm -hmm. he was talking about Mad Men specifically. Um, right, but I, I like that description of how m modern America, at least, or modern culture, I should say, takes uh, something from the past and just revises it, basically. Um, mm -hmm. And Twain wrote Tom Sawyer 30 years after his own childhood. Um, he obviously wrote with nostalgia, um, and then with more than a touch of revisionism, I think. Mm -hmm. So when writing a YA novel. Do you try to avoid revisionism of childhood, yours or someone else's, or is revisionism just part and parcel about writing about growing up? Uh, revisionism is unavoidable and and even a bit necessary because um, there's there's a really big difference between the way I remember being at age eleven, for example, and the way my son actually is at age eleven in terms of his clarity of logic in terms of his ability to to reason things out. I remember being completely reasonable and, and totally with it and grown up. But looking at him and his perception of himself, I think that's how he thinks of himself. But from my perspective as an adult, I'm like, no, you're not there yet, my friend. Um, so I think books in some ways are written to, books for children specifically, are written to help kind of solidify a narrative. That his his narrative of what the world is made of and what he himself consists of is, is in so much flux that um, having having a model in the form of a book or or somebody, you know, making a bit of sense of it for him uh, is really helpful and helps him helps give him perspective, gives him something to measure himself against. Um, and so, so I think that that children's books, in order for them to, to, I think that they do have to revise. I don't think you can actually write from the real perspective of yourself as a child because you you have revised yourself so much that you don't really remember. Is what I'm trying to say. Mm. I don't know if I said that very elegantly, mm. um, but uh, I think 
and I, I, I think that I don't actually try to, to capture exactly what I was at that age. What I try instead is to find things that I've learned, often later in life, but put them in a way that's understandable to myself at that age, if that makes sense. And so uh, lessons about different things that I wish I had known. Lessons sounds really didactic. That's not what I mean. But perspective, a, a view that I was not able to have at that age because I, w I just couldn't see far enough. Um, and so, mm -hmm. you know, Twain, he did, he has a bit of, uh, yes, there's some revision here. I mean, we were discussing a little bit earlier how some ina inaccuracy in his own memory, like Tom loses a tooth, and it's one of his incisors, and that would put him at about six or seven or eight years old, maybe at the oldest, but then he also asked Becky to marry him, and he also, you know, is smoking, and part of me is like, how old is he really? If you look it up, they say he's 12, but you're not losing your incisors at 12. So I'm guessing that that's something Twain has misremembered, for example. He remembers how cool it was to be able to whistle, but not quite what age that really was. So um, that's one thing. But another thing is I feel something he's really doing here is he's talking about education a lot. Uh, he's talking about Tom's education and sort of the difference between, like, what are the th things that really educate us? That for Tom, actually going out in the woods, he observes animals, he's really into insects, um, he's not stupid by any means, he, he, maybe, he can't remember, you know, two Bible verses in a row, but he's got Robin Hood verbatim, right? <laughs> and so he is, he's perfectly capable of remembering the things that interest him. And I think Twain is trying to, to show us, you know, for kids that age, what, what activities are actually educational for them? What, what is actually useful? What are the things he as a child got the most out of? And, um... But again, that, that he's bringing sort of an adult perspective to it, so, you know. Um, but I think a kid reading it would, would feel his sympathy, you know, and, and he's, he's definitely remembering the things he liked, but he's, he's organizing it better. Really, that's, it's, it's a question of organization almost. He's organizing it in a logical way um, that kids themselves in the moment aren't able to, to really do, if that makes sense. <laughs> oh, that makes total sense. I love that. Um, okay. I hadn't thought of that before, of the natural kind of education that you get from the natural world. Mm. Um, mm. And I think it's interesting talking about that, that uh, there's no teacher. Right. And in the schoolroom, there's a teacher who gets made fun of in Tom Sawyer pretty excessively. Mm. So, um, and is that part of like a YA novel as well when you're writing? Is, is, a, a, the protagonist learning without a teacher? Or do they usually have mentors? Or how does that work? Well, I think it can work a variety of ways. And there's no, there's no wrong way to, to do it. Um, but a lot of, I think, what teaches us the, the most memorable lessons in our lives is going to be experience, is going to be, um, you know, and a mentor can kind of direct you. But they, you know, it's like the old saw, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. Right, the mentor can take you right there, mm -hmm. but you're not going to learn it until you you're ready to learn it. And so, um, but YA I think is about that moment. It's about the transition. It's about this transition from the child mind, which is sort of self-centered and not really able to to focus and put things logically, transition from that into being a functional adult. And so, what are the questions? Uh, that you have to ask yourself, what are the things you have to learn? Um, and a lot of it, I mean, we're talking, you know, we're touching here a bit on the being bad and on rules. A lot of it is trying to figure out which rules are worth your time, which uh, customs, which mores, hmm. what, what of that is, is good and, and useful for you. And it's not necessarily the learning by rote that this teacher has done. Well, he makes fun of that teacher. I did feel a little bad for the teacher. But I, I feel like Twain is really talking about himself there and that this stuff was not useful. Um, oh, and what he really rakes him over the coals for, which I thought was really interesting, uh, was miseducation of girls. 
you say, but this is, he just went on and on and on. This is what girls are taught, and this is all sentimental, and look at this rubbish poetry. That, and it, it's, it wasn't like he was saying girls are stupid and this is their fault. It was like, look what we're wasting their brains with, you know? <laughs> and so mm -hmm. that was kind of interesting. Um, but yeah, I think he was thinking of that as being symptomatic of this education that is, is focused on, on the wrong thing. Um, and that there are better questions to be focusing on. And one of the questions is, and this is in my work, something I focus on too, just basic questions of how do I live this life, you know? We don't have an instruction book. Mm -hmm. what, how, do I, how do I work this thing? <laughs> so, you know. That's so great. <laughs> I've got so many ideas in my head. Oh, that was wonderful. Um, wow, that was brilliant. I like that. So Thank one you. of the other things that, that Scott said that kind of ties in with this is that it seems that in doing away with patriarchal authority in um, you know new TV shows about um, non-adult issues, um, he says, we've also perhaps unwittingly killed off all grown-ups. And like you said, Twain touches on a world without grown-ups for a yeah. short time. Um, once is when the boys run off to the island. But they miss their adults, and they miss their world um, pretty quickly. And, and they come back. Um, and so my question for you is, is this a kind of a Stockholm Syndrome where the captives identify with their captors? That's an interesting question. <laughs> but seriously. <laughs> <laughs> is, is growing up the assimilation of a captor's worldview? That's ever? interesting. Well, I, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure about that. Some of the kids, I mean, he has a lot of different kids in this book, really, uh, most of whom we don't ever remember. Mm -hmm. Like, I did not remember Tom Sawyer had a brother, for example. Um, so I feel like Sid, the brother is an example of someone who is assimilating and is just going to follow all the rules and and do everything right. Now, poor fellow, he gets no thanks for this, <laughs> you know, and he doesn't have any fun, and it's sort of it's sort of awful for him. Um, but um, <laughs> that uh, I think I think um, that's sort of a negative example. I think Twain is not thinking that this is the way to go mm -hmm. by any stretch. Yes, Tom does need his adults, but what he really needs, I think, is is attention and validation. And because so many of these bad things he does, and he gets punished for it, it's just, it's just kind of attention-seeking, you know? And, and he mm -hmm. says himself when they go to the island, you know, goofing off is not nearly as fun when there's nobody to, to, you know, whip me for it later, basically. <laughs> and so, um, that part of it, you know, is there's the, the, the joy of, of misbehaving, but also the attention you get, so he knows she cares. You know, he knows Aunt Polly cares because she's sort of horrible <laughs> when he's mad. Um, so there's that, and as another counterexample, you've got Huck Finn, who has no adults at all. Who, who are responsible. I mean, his mm -hmm. father is there somewhere, but we never even see him. He's drunk, he's, he's no count, he's, he's out of the picture. Uh, and so, Huck is, is, is kind of a figure of pathos here. You know, that he has, has no home, he has no, you know... So there's, there's that angle on it, too. Another angle, though, that I thought was really interesting is when they're at church, Earlier on, they'd had Tom showing off for Becky, right? And we're like, oh, yes, so childish, huh? But at church, all the grown-ups are showing off for the judge. <laughs> and he really <laughs> right. makes this parallel clear that uh, actually, in some ways, we don't grow up. <laughs> you know, maybe we get more mannerly. Maybe we, we mm -hmm. have the, the sanctioned ways of, of showing off. But they're still sh just showing off, just like a little boy. And so, uh, yeah, I <laughs> think... <laughs> That's that's part of his Twain's. So he kind humor. of skewers yeah. the. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I like that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so and another so I, example yeah. of Twain's adultless. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. I I totally lost my train of thought already. So go on. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was just thinking of a, another example of. 
Twain's adultless world is when Tom and Becky get lost in the cave. Mm -hmm. um, and Tom finds a way out. And that whole thing seems, you know, Twain was like the father of realism, right? And mm -hmm. that whole cave thing seems like such an allegorical scene to me. Mm -hmm. um, and, mm -hmm. you know, there's the Plato thing. There's, for some reason, it reminds me of Dante. I mean, it's just very mm -hmm. heavy with, with mm -hmm. meeting and meeting mm -hmm. Joe and, you know, the archetypes that you're playing with and, you know, and he eventually finds his own way out. Um, right, right. So th this is another moment of truth, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, it is. It is. How, and a place where he you, can really show his intelligence again. He's, you know. So when you create a character that is mischievous or bordering okay. on delinquency, but that the audience, <laughs> how do you know... How do you create it so the audience knows and trusts that your character will do the right thing? That is a really, that's a, an interesting question and a challenge. It is always a challenge to create a character that the audience trusts. Um, and I think for me, the key to that uh, is, is honesty, that you try and make the character uh, as honest as possible so that they know that... Whatever it is they're doing, it, it's coming from a from from some kind of truth, from a true place, if that makes any sense. Um, because that's mm -hmm. that I think is, is the trust there that you trust that the character, you trust their intentions, you trust um, that they're going to try at least. It is hard though. It is hard, and I think you know it 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 could have gone either way. The fact that he had already testified at the trial helps, right? And the fact that he'd had these other moments mm -hmm. of sort of realization of, of other people's feelings, you know, all along helps. He really has grown to that moment. Um, and, uh, yeah, honestly, I'm not sure why Becky trusts him now, <laughs> but, because uh, he wasn't always nice to her, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but, but, she, she does. She's a little bit of a, a noodle, in my opinion, but, you know, she's there to be pretty. But, uh, yeah, he, I think we, we believe he'll try. And and also, too, when he has the realization, for example, that the, the string is in his pocket, right? We remember that from before. And we remember, you know, the, the various ways he, he thinks it through. These are skills you've sort of seen him using before. And so, so as he's doing this, you realize, oh, okay, yes, you know, fingers crossed that there is a, a way out because we don't know that for sure. Um, but, mm -hmm. yeah, he's... And I think having Becky there, having somebody to take care of, you know, that he, that is part of what helps him rise to the occasion too. And part of something that helps us trust him because we see that this is coming from an impulse in him to take care of somebody else. And that that is, that is a fundamentally a, a generous thing. And so that is, is right. Not just thinking of his own joys, but, but thinking of someone else's livelihood, someone else's life is in his hands, and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, that's, you know, it's a nice, it's a nice moment, and uh, I'm glad there was a way out. I, I was scared. <laughs> <laughs> and I love um, talking about, like, the good and the bad in Tom Sawyer, and I think mm -hmm. the biggest good thing that there is is um, that the community is, comes together over and over again to help other people. You know, mm -hmm. to search for the kids twice, you know, and mm -hmm. to um, mm -hmm. help the widow Douglas, and so that to me seems like it's the primary um, good thing that Twain talks about in that book. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, I like that too. I like that too. I don't know. I've heard. I don't know if this. I don't. I, it's been a long time since I read Huck Finn. I want to read Huck Finn now. Um, that Tom Square was in some ways a warm-up for Huck Finn, and that he actually explores some of these things in more depth uh, with higher stakes in Huck Finn. But again, I, it's been a long time um, since I've read it. But uh, I don't. I, th I feel like Tom Sawyer stands pretty well by itself. I mean, there are mm -hmm. some cartoonish elements. <laughs> there are some things that I think if my son were reading it, I would want to talk to him about. You know, sort of the the. A casual racism, <laughs> you know, 
know. And but this is one of these things that I think I think the a work of literature can still be worth reading, even with stuff like that in it. That it's 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 um, that our morals change over time, and have changed, and some of our, our customs have changed, and things that we we consider appropriate or not. But we're able to look at this and say, okay, here is a guy who was smart. So I'm, I'm talking about uh, Mark Twain here. He was smart. Mm -hmm. He was humane. Even he fell subject to some prejudices of his day. And this mm -hmm. is sort of a, another another angle, and it is a lesson for us to not be smug and say, well, we're super smart now, and we would never fall for such things. Um, actually, we're just as blind to our own, you know, the, the things of our own day. So. Um, mm -hmm. That's a whole nother level to it there too, I think, that should be looked at critically, but also should just be, you know, try and take what good you can from, from the work as a whole. Um, mm -hmm. so. so in talking about like the, the mores of the time, one of the things mm -hmm. um, that came up for me when I was reading was uh, just the, the roles of women right? Tom Sawyer. So, um, one of the things, um, you know, you've got Aunt Polly, who's a spinster. She's raising these children. She's a devout believer in quack medicine. Um, she mm -hmm. both loves and practically abuses Tom in her efforts at controlling him. Um, right. So she, she seems kind of almost tongue-in-cheek, um, kind of a conglomeration of the faulty attributes. Right. And you know that her love for Tom it seems to be like her only good attribute almost. I don't know mm -hmm. what do you think. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, yeah, she's, she's, is kind of a caricature as well in some ways. Um, there was one moment that was really nice though, I thought, um, when he gave, was giving the medicine to the cat and the cat was basically getting <laughs> drunk and careening about the house or, because it, it hated it so much and like she had this moment of, of empathy where she suddenly realized Oh, I'm making him take this stuff that is cruel if he makes the cat take it. Therefore, maybe, maybe <laughs> this is not the best idea I ever had. You know, um, so I thought that was a nice, a nice moment of nuance there for her. But yeah, on the whole, the women are not as as complicated uh, or as interesting in this book. But that's another thing that that has changed over time. You know, and and mm -hmm. uh, that we we have expectations now that the women characters are are hopefully going to be <laughs> real people and well-rounded, and that we would prefer that. Um, you know, <laughs> it's every book has their its flaws. I'm afraid, and and that that's one. But that's it, you know, there's enough. Again, there's enough. There's enough good stuff in this that that we can kind of. You know, acknowledge the flaws and then say, "But here's the good stuff." So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm gonna flip back to that death of adulthood in America. Mm. Um, you responded to it by saying, and I just wanted to to kind of close with this. I thought this was really beautiful. You stated that I think YA literature is hopeful literature. Here are the things that really matter. Here is the way we overcome our limitations, work together, and build a future worth having. The world is full of possibility and potential. I don't think you're ever too old to need a reminder of these things. Hmm. Right on. I thought that was great. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. I really, I think that's one of the reasons, I mean, right now there's sort of a surgence of, of, of adults enjoying young adult literature. Mm -hmm. And I really think that's part of it, is that it is hopeful and that we're, you know, we're kind of living in, in somewhat difficult times in some ways and well like, what times aren't difficult I guess but it, <laughs> I feel like this is something people are, are really latching on to right now because um, mm -hmm. it's good to have a reminder that that we all struggle with these questions of what is right what is wrong what how do I work this and uh, that young adult is about mm -hmm. people experiencing the same struggles and uh, and Tom de definitely does too here, you know, even though he's he's a little inarticulate about it, but I think it, as an adult reading the book, you're able to see his growth and, and understand the progress that's being made. So it's a hopeful book too. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
Well, thank you so much for joining us, Rachel. I really oh, appreciate it. Thank you this. so much for having me. I really I enjoyed it, and I hope people will read this and, and think about it and talk about it, and it's, it's a good book. All right. Thank you.